much of my teaching ends up being giving them permission to be, be themselves instead of telling them what I want them to be. Um, I would, I gravitate towards students who have more of an idea of what they like and what they don't like and, and then try to help mentor teach them um, by giving them maybe more craft to be able to achieve the type of music that they want or lead them beyond the music that they've studied in the past. Um, but I always allow my students to choose their own repertoire, which I feel is important because I believe that they will always play the music that they choose better than any music that I choose for them. And then I want them to ask questions and I want them to question my answers because my art is different than your art and I can't impose those values on yours, I wouldn't dare to. Um, and yet at the same time, a young student needs a little bit of direction. And so I, I, I try to help with that. But then through the variety of things that I've done in my life, I hope that I could bring some sort of light to, to most questions, technical or musical. I, yeah, so my teaching is that way. And then I try to remain a student. As I said, stealing from my colleagues here, um, when I teach at Cal Arts, I'm a lifelong student at Cal Arts. That's why I wanted to teach there because we're, we're teaching techniques that aren't codified in any fashion. Uh, there's no section in the Arbin book on split tones. Um, there's no section in the Arbin book on, you know, multiphonics and quarter tones and eighth tones and different tuning systems. And so I've had to learn all that as I go. And then the music is changing from one year to year to the next year. And the student body is changing from one year to the next year. And it's a vital musical place. And I so enjoy teaching there because I also enjoy studying there. I'm having new musical experiences there. And then when I'm teaching at Bard, at the Bard Conservatory, in a more traditional place, I'm teaching students that are really, really smart. Because to study at the Bard Conservatory, you're required to have a double degree. So the, the president of Bard, Leon Botstein, believes absolutely that a musical education is, is great, but it's not enough. One has to have more education during their college years than that. So they are, they are required to take a five-year course where they declare in the second or the third year, I'm not quite sure when they make their, their choice, um, a second major. And yeah, so we have students there that are doing degrees in trumpets and in economics or, you know, trumpet and science or whatever. And I think that that's brilliant absolutely brilliant and the quality of the traditional training there is very strong the orchestra is excellent we have a postgraduate orchestra there called the orchestra now which is super to to be part of um and so i enjoy that environment also i get to teach i get to conduct there a little bit more conduct music that i'm more familiar with um and so yeah, I guess I'm a student there as well. Always grabbing ideas. I really like this line that you said about giving the students permission to find their voice as an artist. That's something maybe just in life in general, I realized maybe in the past two years, and I'm just 33, but that you know nobody's gonna give you permission to start a competition or start Chosen Veil or to compose yeah. a piece or you know you have to give yourself your own guidance in life. Yeah. Alex, we have to remember that most, most college students have been in school since 
kindergarten somewhere, or the preschool. And in, in most of that early training, they're being told what to do because they have no ability yet. They have no reference. They have no craft. They have no, no context. Um, and so many of these undergraduate going on through graduate school students have never been out of school and yet they're growing as human beings and they're becoming adults and yeah when i see them at that age then much of what i do is give them permission to to assert themselves be different than the person sitting next to you don't try to sound like anyone else never copy you know we all have our own voices. We all have our own musics. We all have music that appeals to us, that gives us goosebumps that are, we find curious and interesting, and then music that we don't care for. And you know, let's assert ourselves on all of those levels so that we have more context, we have more background, because it means something to us. You know, Hokan Hardenberger, in this room, actually, he was probably standing right where I'm sitting right now, um, talking to the class a few years ago. Somebody asked the question, what do you program? How do you program a recital? Do you, do you take into account your audience and who they are? And he said, God, no. How could I do that? How could I know who's in the audience? I don't know any of these people. I can't tell. Maybe there's one audience that's young and another one that's old, but that doesn't mean that I know what their tastes are. And then the person said, well, then do you choose something from every period? And he said, oh, that's the worst way to program that I've ever heard. And this, the student here sort of frantically said, well, then, how do you program? And he said, I program music that I love. And I choose music that I love for my own personal reasons. And because I love that music, I will play it with more conviction, more clarity, more authority. And then hopefully the audience will recognize that and enjoy the performance because they enjoy hearing my work and my love for that music. And that was a wonderful moment here, again, of giving permission um, to follow your dreams and what you love and choose music that you love to play and then play it like you love it. And so I guess that becomes a large message at Chosen Vale. It becomes a large message in the places that I teach with my class. Um, the people that I mentor, um, mostly when they ask me what they should do next, I return the favor and say, what do you want to be doing? What do you dream of doing? How badly do you want it? It might not come quickly. It shouldn't come quickly. The greatest careers are the ones that the person has had to really earn that career through their, their hard work and then their perseverance, their patience. But it'll come if they love it and they work for it tirelessly. It'll come. And so, yeah, if there's a common denominator through any of this, um, it's that. <laughs>